Welcome to this edition of Real World White Collar Law. My name is Nick Johnson, and I'm a partner here at Barron's Wag Leonard. And I'm David Deach. I'm special counsel here at Barron's Wag Leonard. David, it's great to be here today. Uh, we have a, a, an exciting discussion today, something that uh, is an important discussion for, for actually impacting all businesses, regardless of size, industry, and, and location. And the topic that we're going to be talking about today is corporate investigations. And so let's, let's just kind of get right into it. Let's kind of tell our audience what it is about corporate investigations they need to know. If you're a business owner, why do you need to take these things seriously? And, and when we're talking about corporate investigations, what is it that we're talking about? So what are some examples of issues that would give rise to a corporate investigation? Well, to be clear, Nick, what we're talking about are internal investigations. So this is talking about why a company and when a company is going to examine its own employees and its own conduct in order to tell whether there's been wrongdoing. So there's a lot of different kinds of allegations that can come up that can lead a company to want to do an internal investigation. The, the, some of the most common are, for example, employment uh, em allegations of wrong, wrongdoing in the workplace, and I know you're very familiar with that. Sure, yeah, so you know, we do, obviously, with our corporate clients, do workplace investigations all the time. Um, you know, typically, that's of the discrimination and harassment variety, um, but, but actually, Corporate investigations are actually much broader than that, right? Uh, of course they are, because really they can deal with almost any kind of wrongdoing that occurs within the corporation or on behalf of the corporation. So you have all kinds of financial impropriety that can occur. You have things like violations of the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, or you even have uh, whistleblower allegations that can run the gamut from financial wrongdoing to issues about the products of the company or the company services that they're providing. And so these investigations, I mean, these are outside of the courtroom, right? I mean, this is typically, you know, non-litigation settings, right? Yeah, this is, uh, you know, I wouldn't say this has nothing to do with litigation because a lot of the time, the whole purpose of the investigation is to prepare for litigation that may be coming. But this isn't part of litigation. It's not undertaken under the uh, auspices of a court. It's not under the supervision of a judge. These are actions that companies can and often should take on their own behalves in order to set themselves up to address important issues. Okay, so, so you're a company, you're a business owner, and you receive one of these issues that kind of gives rise to this investigation. Um, why is it in a company's best interest to investigate? What's the reason behind why you should investigate? Well, the most, the, 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 the easiest ones are there are some areas where statutes require that a company undertake a self-examination and an internal investigation, and the most obvious ones are things like Title VII uh, and employment issues. But there are also situations, particularly, um, or, or for example, in the case of a publicly owned company, when the board of a company may have a fiduciary obligation, that it's in the best interest of the company to determine it, when it receives a credible allegation of wrongdoing, whether wrongdoing has in fact occurred so that the company can basically set itself up to protect itself from harm. And I, and I know at least in the employment context that there are, there are legal defenses available to companies that take these complaints seriously and do investigate them. In the employment context, you have the Farragher-Ellerth defense, which if you are a company and you investigate alleged wrongdoing, take prompt corrective action and the plaintiff or the complaining party doesn't avail themselves of those protections, that's a defense that you can subsequently raise. And so um, I would say that that's another area why it makes sense for, for companies to investigate. That's definitely true. And, and I think there are, uh, there are analogous situations in other contexts. Uh, when you're talking about regulatory enforcement or law enforcement, um, there are definitely situations in which the fact that a company undertook a prompt and serious internal investigation to determine what the facts were can definitely redound to its benefit down the road. Okay, so, so you're a company now, you've, you've received a complaint, you now know the, the many benefits and reasons why you should investigate. In terms of who's doing the investigation or who should be involved. I mean, you know, sometimes these will come to, to HR if it's, a, if it's a, you know, a workplace complaint of discrimination or harassment. It may go to the, one of the executives. Um, why should a company use an attorney? Why should they bring an outside counsel or in-house? What are some of the benefits to bringing in an attorney? Yeah, there are a lot of 
it, it's a whole separate subject that we could discuss about how to structure and scope one of these investigations. But the reason to have an attorney undertake an internal investigation is really because the attorney has the somewhat unique ability to protect the information that comes out of the investigation, either because it involves attorney-client privileged communications or because the work that is done and the results of that work are protected under what's called the attorney work product doctrine. Um, and that also is a fairly complicated subject and perhaps you and I will sit here and talk about that in another <laughs> podcast. But having an attorney be involved in that um, is, uh, is, is one way to structure the investigation so that it is most useful and so that the company has within its own discretion the ability to disclose or not disclose the results of the investigation. Makes a lot of sense. And I mean, I think to your point, David, I mean, you and I could sit here for, for hours on end talking about, you know, best practices when it comes to workplace investigations. Um, here, you know, this is really an introduction to workplace investigations. If, if you're a business owner out there, I mean, what would you say are some general guiding principles that companies should be mindful of when, when undertaking a corporate investigation? Well, the, the first and the foremost, I would say, is act promptly. When, if a company acts promptly to address credible allegations, to determine whether they have substance, to, to, to determine what the facts actually are, they show a seriousness of purpose, and they show that they're taking seriously the possibility that there was wrongdoing by one of their employees and potentially on, on behalf of or in the name of the company. The second uh, is that the company should uh, devote the time and resources that are necessary depending on the scope of the allegations. In some cases, internal investigations can be fairly narrow. In others, they can be very broad. Sure. And you have to bring in sometimes some other parts of the company that may have the expertise about the facts of the particular product or the particular financial aspects that are involved. But to devote that time and resources so that the investigation is not just a way of covering up or a way of checking a box, but truly a way of determining what the facts are. And the third is that the co it's very important that the company preserve all of the evidence that is involved with these allegations. This includes um, documents, it includes digital records, emails, text messages, other kinds of financial digital documents, so that there is never any, um, any basis for anyone to question or accuse the company of, uh, of getting rid of documents. Um, you want to preserve it in a state so that if there is civil litigation down the road, if there is a regulatory enforcement action or a law enforcement action, you have all those documents and they've been preserved in the state that they were when you found them. Very informative, David, um, on a very important topic. Thank you very much for the, the information you shared today. Oh, well, it was a pleasure to speak with you about it, and I'm sure we'll be speaking more on this topic in the future. Thank you all for tuning in for another episode of Real World White Collar Law. Thanks.